Hi, I'm Brett Johnson, former United States Most Wanted cyber criminal, now good guy, and host of The Brett Johnson Show. Today's episode is episode number 81. On today's episode, we're going to call it Reaching Out for Advice when we come back. All right, so we are back to The Brett Johnson Show, episode number 81. We're calling it Reaching Out for Advice. And the reason we're calling it Reaching Out for Advice is the other day, I got a letter. Well, I got an email. I got an email. And the title of the email was Reaching Out for Advice. And it was this gentleman who had contacted me anonymously. He didn't want to tell me his real name. He had contacted me anonymously for advice on how not to break the law. And I was tempted. I was tempted to respond immediately with Jim Carrey saying, stop breaking the law, asshole, as my advice. But then I reeled it in and I was like, you know, this would make a good show. It would show it. would. We could talk about cognitive dissonance, talk about choices, how they at the end of the day, it's really your choice. You don't have to decide to break the law. You can choose not to. And we could talk about that thing that I preach constantly of thoughts determine feelings Feelings determine actions. If you change your thought process, guess what? Your actions will change at the end of the day. So I thought it would make a nice short episode to just read the letter out loud. Maybe I can hold my tongue and not comment on the letter as I'm reading it. I have no idea because let's be honest, I like to spout off at the mouth a lot. But that being said, I figured we could just dive into it walk through this guy um, and and maybe, you know, he'll watch the show. Maybe he'll take the advice. Maybe not. It's his choice at the end of the day. But I, I thought it was a really interesting letter. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see here. Let's pull this letter up. Let's go ahead and share my screen so that everyone so that everyone can read along. All right. So we're now sharing the screen. This is the letter. He sent it over to my golem at anglerfish.com address. Anyone's welcome to contact me. And here's the thing. If you are really serious about turning your life around, you know, you've been a criminal, you are a criminal. I understand that the road to, to recovery is never a straight line. You are going to backslide. But as long as you continue that forward momentum, you will eventually get there. So if you're one of these individuals that's serious about turning your life around, I absolutely want to talk to you. I absolutely do. And I want to help you as much as I can. If you are full of bullshit, I have very, my, my patience wears thin with bullshit these days. I really can't cope with it. I really don't want to hear it. Uh, I've interviewed some felons recently, and some of these felons are, are, um, extremely good people. They have served massive amounts of time and they really want to turn their lives around. And I, I, I want to help them as much as I possibly can, as much as I possibly can. But I've also talked to a few felons recently that, hey, they're full of shit. And I let them spout off at the mouth. And I'm, you know, we'll comment on the show when it happens. Okay. But bear that in mind. If you, if you, uh, if you're out there breaking the law and you're serious about turning your life around, please contact me. I, I do want to talk to you and maybe I can do some good. Maybe we can, you know, I can be part of that support group. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to give you any type of verbal masturbation. I will simply tell you what's what, what's what, and what's not. I mean, I'm not going to pull punches with you. Um, but that's what's needed in a situation like this. You don't need someone to stroke you. And say everything is going to be all right. You need someone that's going to be honest and upfront about things. So let's dive into this, this letter. Okay, it was titled, Reaching Out for Advice. And it begins, Hi, Brett. I first discovered you while listening to a Lex Friedman podcast. And I've now begun to listen to your online broadcast episodes. I'm very intrigued with your previous career and subsequent turnaround. In some ways, it's similar to my own situation. I'm sharing my story anonymously based on the information that I disclose. I'll give you a brief rundown. rundown. In 2014, I went down the dark web rabbit hole. I was intrigued by the Silk Road, and after months of reading forum threads and engaging with others, I decided to give carding a try. 
I had minimal success with online work, but I immediately hit pay dirt with in-store dumps, and I've never looked back. So, he and I told you I wouldn't be able to hold my tongue. He he's he's he reaches out to me because he you know my story is the guy who was able to turn this shit around, and I hope that he understood that I had a lot of help turning this shit around. That you cannot do it by yourself. Yes, you can make the decision to do that. But you have to have a support group, a safety net, people that you can talk to, people that will give you honest, direct feedback, people that aren't just yes men or yes women, and and someone that is there to call you on your bullshit. Okay, so that's very important. So he found Silk Road 2014. I actually think Silk Road shut down before that, but maybe not. I'd have to look at it, not that I really care. All right, but he says that he gave... Online carding, so CNP carding. So he was buying credit card numbers on Silk Road back then. They they sold for you know eight twelve dollars, about what they sell for now. So he was trying to buy shit online using stolen credit card numbers, and he was failing miserably. So then he decides to go the dump route. So dumps are the mag. That's the magnetic information that's on the back of your card, the the back of your debit or credit card. That magnetic stripe. There are three data tracks on that. The first data track is the customer's name. Second data track is the card number forward slash 16-digit algorithm out beside of that. Third data track is called indiscriminate data. No one uses it. What's bought and sold, the dump, is the second data track. Back then, those things sold for around 30 bucks. Today, those things sell for about 30 bucks. You're sent that data track. You have to get a counterfeit card or a prepaid debit card that you get and re- re-encode it, something like that. And you go in the store and start to shop. So he says that, hey, I failed miserably with the online shit, but I found a good dump provider and I hit pay dirt with that. And he says he never looked back. Now, continuing with his email, he says, now at this point in time, I had just transitioned my career as a professional commodity trader from working with a proprietary trading firm to going solo. It was not a good situation for anyone to succeed. I was undercapitalized and we had just had our first kid. Needless to say, the stress to perform well and consistently was a lot to bear. I first used the in-store swiping as a way to quote, supplement the times when I wasn't earning enough to cover our monthly expenses, but that need continued to grow. So what he says is, and and maybe people are starting to pick up on this already. Lord knows I did, but he says, you know, hey, I was I just changed careers, jobs. I was going solo, and you know I, I wasn't able to make ends meet. So in order to make ends meet, you know, I, I started the, I started swiping dumps, and you know, I, I, that that was what it started out was you know trying to make ends meet, but the need continued to grow. Well, here's what actually happens. When you start to steal money, the value of money becomes less. You start to not really appreciate or respect the money that's coming in because you're able to steal it. So it's not surprising that the need to make ends meet would continue to grow because you've got a lot of excess cash coming in that to you has really kind of lost the meaning of value. So you start to spend it on bullshit. Let's be honest. You start to spend it on bullshit. Yeah, you're paying your bills, but you're starting to spend it on bullshit as well. And of course, that bullshit tally continues to rise. In 2015, continuing his email, in 2015, I had my first run-in with law enforcement. A detective from a Western suburb contacted me to ask questions about an identity theft situation for a consumer that contacted their police department. They traced back the in-store swipe at the grocery store to my license plate, and they wanted to know if I was using that specific identity of the cardholder for anything else. I explained no, and somehow social engineered my way out of that situation freely, or so I thought. But I was free to go, and I went back home to resume my, quote, normal activities. Toward the end of 2015, I decided to stop swiping and focus on going live with my trading business again. I was developing a better algorithm. I have trouble with that word. 
algorithmic trading strategy strategy that included tighter risk controls. It worked well for a couple of months until an extra volatile market period. I began in, I began earning three times my daily average profits, but then my losses also equaled the same amounts. I decided to override my risk controls because I thought I knew better than the algos. Hubris got the best of me. My losses snowballed, and by the time I did anything, I had lost 80% of my capital and all unrealized profits. I decided to go back to swiping again. I began hitting everything hard, using Joker's stashes, using Joker's stash, and going through a couple of dozen dumps per day. At the height of my activity, I was probably netting around $40,000 a month, but my average was closer to $20,000 a month. So this dude, and you may be able to tell I'm getting a little uh, stressed with this bullshit, a little, <laughs> you know, I, I don't suffer bullshit lightly. So he's he's working and he's taking these chances and of course the chances don't pay off the house wins at the end of the day so he decides to start going full fledged into dumps and what he does is he hits Joker's stash so Joker's stash is closed down now the uh, the people who ran it shut it down and they had profited a billion dollars selling dumps for those who don't know Joker's stash started out uh, selling dumps the the initial market there was absolutely crap. Um, the the dumps that were that were initially offered on Joker's stash were garbage. They they rarely worked. They had an extremely bad name. But the people who owned that site kept at it, and they after a, a time they got very good dumps. They got very good information. They became a premier market, and they ended up profiting over a billion dollars. Now that being said, that does not mean that. You know, some of the people over there did not go to prison or may not be working for law enforcement. I know for a fact that the the admin password to gain access to that uh, to the admin site was rectum, R-E-C-T-U-M. Now, how do I know that? Well, I know the individual who fished out the leadership over there and got access to it. And uh, I would imagine that consequences were to be paid that may have prompted that site to shut down the way that it did. So he starts running. Pay attention to what he says here. Using Joker's stash, he was going through a couple of dozen dumps per day. So he was he was full-fledged into carding. He was swiping 24 cards a day. A day. Either he had dumps and pins or he was buying merchandise. More than likely, he was buying merchandise. And he was profiting $40,000 a month. Now, I was told the other day, I was on a, um, I was on a, podca on a podcast with uh, Herb Weisbaum. He's a former uh, Today Show host. And he's a radio uh, uh, personality now up in Washington State. And I was, we had this group podcast. We were talking about AI. And one of the individuals there said that, you know, all criminals are lazy. Let me dissuade you of that notion. Criminals are not lazy. They certainly are not. Those, those drug dealers, they work their asses off. Those trap stars, the people who stand at the corner slinging crack or what have you, they work their asses off. They absolutely do. It's usually, it's a lifestyle. It's called a criminal lifestyle for a reason. It's not a nine to five job. It's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, 365 day a year lifestyle. It You work constantly. When I was breaking the law, I was on a computer typically 16 hours a day, maybe more than that, 12 to 16 a day easily. Uh, the, the only time I was typically off a computer was when I was running drops or when I was hitting ATM machines to pull cash out. Every other time, I started my day on a computer and I ended my day on a computer. That was my life. That is not uncommon for criminal activity. Yes, you do have some criminals that are just lazy pieces of shit, but most criminals work their asses off. This guy is running 24 cards a day. 
to pull in that forty thousand dollars a month profit. Not only is he pulling twenty, is he running twenty four cards a day, but understand he's got to go. He's got to take road trips to do this. He's got to plot out stores to do this. He's got to figure out what merchandise to get. He's got to have. Uh, he's got to carry the merchandise, store the merchandise someplace. If he's reselling merchandise, which he's doing, he's shipping that merchandise out. So he's also running drops. He's running shipping addresses. He's doing all this stuff. This is a full time job. Now, I said that because I want you to realize too. He says that he's, he's doing this trading, commodities trading. When the hell does he have time to do any commodities trading? We'll, we'll pick that thought back up, but just bear this in mind as we go through his email. When the hell does he have time? It sounds to me, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a genius, but it sounds to me like his full-time job is carding and, you know, the commodities trading is just kind of something, eh, that he's kind of doing on the side. Maybe I'm wrong. Let's continue with email and then go from there. We'll pick it up here. In-store swiping was becoming more challenging as retailers introduced EMV, chip and pin, or I'm sorry, chip and signature in the United States, introduced EMV readers to their point of sale terminals. And I grew tired driving around the city and sur suburbs every day to, quote, make ends meet. I decided once and for all, it was time to go back to work with a full-time job and not rely on my trading anymore. But I didn't think I had many choices of a career besides trading, as that's all I did professionally. And we were now a family of four, two kids with high monthly expenses living in a big city. Plus, I got used to bringing in $20,000 or so monthly, and I thought we needed that kind of cash. Toward the end of summer 2016, I got a job as a trader to managing my own portfolio of strategies with another prop firm, and I had no personal risk. The only bad thing was that I wouldn't be able to bring home any profits except quarterly. So I decided that I needed to continue my swiping for a few more months to, quote, get by until I started to bring in money legitimately. On the morning of November 16th, 2016, I went into the trading firm like any other day, except later that morning, I noticed a bunch of law enforcement approach the receptionist area and immediately... I knew my time was done. They executed a search warrant at my apartment, surprising my wife and two girls while I was arrested at the trading firm. I was charged with identity theft, money laundering, and conspiracy to organize a crime ring or something like that. I was stuck in jail for two weeks until someone could bail me out with proof of funds that weren't fraudulently obtained. Needless to say, this was my time hitting rock bottom. I refound my religion in jail. I was born and raised Catholic, but had fallen away. And I learned that I needed a group of people that I could confide in. Much like you've shared, I had led a secretive life for so long, and it had turned me into a much different person than I was before. It was someone I didn't like. I'll fast forward a bit here. On March 3rd, 2017, I pled guilty to one count of aggravated identity theft, a cardholder under 62 years old, and the other charges were dropped. I received a lenient sentence, two years of felony probation and restitution. It was great that I stayed out of prison, but I now had the scarlet letter of a felony on my record. And not only that, but we lost all money and savings, whether legally obtained or not. And our family was now destitute. I'll fast forward again. On August 2016, on August 16, 2018, I accepted a job as a business consultant with the Archdiocese of Chicago. I went back to my Catholic roots and was taken in by a great group of guys who accepted me for who I am and not what I did previously. It led to my second chance at life. I regained trust and performed well with my role. And I was able to leverage my experience supporting merger integrations with the Arch to jump into an operational role 
back in the private sector. I joined a boutique M&A consulting firm as a chief of staff to one of the co-founders in 2021. It was more responsibility, more money, and it was a chance to continue building this new career. But, of course there's a but, but things changed just a few months ago in May 2023. My role ceased to exist. I became unemployed again, though thankfully I found a couple of contract gigs to help me bring in cash while I search for my next FT full-time role. The problem, though, is that I've become immersed in carding forums again, and I feel myself inching closer to pulling the trigger into fraud again. I don't want to do it, and objectively, I know that it will lead down a bad path. Though I feel trapped and don't know what to do, I feel desperate for money, even just to make ends meet. And I feel like there are things I can do that aren't necessarily bad, just, quote, taking advantage of holes, end quote. What are your thoughts on this? Ah, now we come to the rub. What are your thoughts on this? We are now a family of five, three girls. And while our expenses aren't as extravagant as they were years back, they are still high, with Catholic school tuition coming up and just ensuring that we have food and a roof over our heads. I'm estimating around 3 k deficit this month in August, followed by $2,000 deficits each month thereafter. Unless, of course, the job situation changes for the better. I know you can relate to all of this since you've been here before, and I'm hopeful you'll talk some sense into me. I just fear that I've got my mind made up already. Thanks for reading. This is a bunch of text, and I know it's a lot to read. Well, it's a lot to stomach as well, and it's a lot to swallow as well. It's a lot. Overall, it's a lot. So here's the thing, dude. Um, you've already made up your mind. Let's be honest. You've already made up your mind. You're already carding. I mean, I don't suffer bullshit lightly. So let's just get that out. You've already made up your mind. You're already carding. That's why you contacted me anonymously. You just wanted me to say something along the lines of, you know, hey, I understand. You got to do what you got to do right now, but just make sure it doesn't last that long. You want me to say that? I'm not going to say that. What I'm going to say is you're a liar. That's what I'm going to say. What I'm going to say is you don't care about your family. You don't care about those three daughters. You don't care about your wife. You lied to them once. They found out that you were a criminal. And now you're lying to them again. That's what I'm going to say. And I'm going to tell you that your lies are such, they're so obvious that it's obvious to me and probably to most of my listeners that you do not care about your family. If you did, you wouldn't be doing that. Okay. Now you said I had been there before and you're right. You're absolutely right. I have been there before and I lied to my family. You know why I lied to my family? Because me committing crime was more important than my family. You committing crime is more important than your family. Now you're going to sit there and you're going to, this is maybe flying in your face and you're going to say, no, you're absolutely wrong, but I'm not, I'm not. And if you were objective, and if you had pause, and if you could just step outside of yourself for a minute, you'd realize that too. The crime is more important than your children, those three girls and your wife. The crime. Okay. The email that I read, the email that I read was of a gentleman who was a carter. And on the side, he was doing this day trading. Here's the truth of the matter. You cannot serve two masters. All right. You can't. You have to serve one master and you have to decide, you have to choose which master that is. There's a reason that you went broke. There's a reason that you weren't successful with that commodity trading. And then when you went solo and that reason was you had this other stuff on the back burner, 
this crime stuff, but it wasn't on the back burner. That was actually the front burner. And you had the day trading on the back burner. You didn't respect that career. You didn't give that career your all. What you gave your all was the swiping, 24 dumps a day. I know how much work that is. And I would doubt seriously you'd be able to do to seriously take any other career in hand, any other. So your commodity trading and all that was actually on the back burner. It was simmering. You know, you were uh, you were the carter, you were the criminal, and you were hoping that the other would take off, and you were funding that doing the carding. You talk about the bills that are being paid. Let me tell you this right now: if you can't make ends meet. You need to realign your budget. I don't know where your kids are going to school. I don't know what kind of uh, hobbies are doing anything else like that. What, what extracurricular activities, what have you. But let me tell you, you can make the choice to not break the law. You don't. If you've got a three thousand dollar deficit on a month or a two thousand dollar deficit on a month, and you can't make the ends meet, then it's up to you to cut budget. Whether that means change schools change homes, uh, let a car go back, buy a used vehicle, cut out extracurricular activities, uh, start shopping instead of you know going to Kroger or Publix for, for, for groceries. You go to Save-A-Lot for groceries. And by God, I've done that because you're right. I've been there. So that's, that's what we're talking about is that I want to go through this email and point out these things to you. And by this point in time, hell, you may have already disconnected from today's show. I, I, I don't know. All right. But, um, you know, you 2014, you went through, you went down the rabbit hole. Why, why did you get on Silk Road? You know, most people do not visit the dark web just out of curiosity. Most people don't find Silk Road out of curiosity. And most people don't take the time to start reading forums because Silk Road did not have a forum. So you had other forums to find out about carding at that point in time. So 2014, that may have been evolution. Um, you obviously were around while Alpha Bay was up. So those forums were around. Um, Tor forums, I believe, was another forum that was around at that point in time. So you were obviously on these forums reading about carding, finding out who you could buy from, things like that. You were not just, you just didn't happen to come across CVVs, you know, online stolen credit card information. You you searched that out and decided to buy that after doing proper research. That's why you went over to dumps. Somebody convinced you to try dumps, which means that you bought the dumps, you bought the cards, or you had you had a, you found a provider that was able to provide counterfeit cards with the dumps already on them. This is work. And then you had to learn how to do all this stuff. So you obviously didn't have time to to work a a to to commit to a legal job. You never committed to that dude. You never did. You committed to crime. And I'm sorry I'm climbing your ass about that, but understand that. You, when I say you you can't have two masters, your master here was cybercrime. It was carding. Your master was not the trading. You ha, you can't commit to two masters. You committed to crime. The other one was just something that you did as a hobby. And it broke you because you didn't respect it. And the reason you didn't respect it is because you had all this stolen money coming in. And you were focused on that instead of focusing on this legal career that you could have been building up. Okay, that's what was going on. All right. So uh, 2015, you had your first run in with law enforcement. And I, I just want to go through this again. A detective from a western suburb contacted me to ask questions about an identity theft situation for a consumer that contacted that contacted their police department. So and they traced you back. They got you on camera swiping and then they Got you on camera in, in the parking lot, getting in your car. The cops call you, so the victim complains. The cops call you, already knowing it's you. You admitted to it, and then you think that you social engineered your way out of, out of it. No, you didn't. You didn't. 
Not at all, man. That's that's part of this cognitive dissonance, this faulty thinking. That super optimism is what it's called. I'm free. I social engineered my, engineered my way out of it. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Cop now knows, that you, and you've admitted to a law enforcement officer that you're an identity thief. Okay? Absolutely, that's what happened there. So you weren't free at all, and you went back to resume your normal activities of carding, and on, then on the side, when you had time, of the trading. Okay? Toward the end of 2015, decided to start to stop swiping. And, and here's the thing. I've been there, too. I mean, when, when crime was my, was my bread and butter, and that was my, my God, you know, there were times that I would that I would set it to the side. I've quit. I've quit. But no, I hadn't quit. You know, I was just trying to convince myself I, I was quitting. I wasn't. You did the same thing. Okay? So your losses, and then you go broke because, again, you didn't respect your side hustle, which was the trading. And the reason you didn't respect that is because you were the criminal. That was your primary focus. Okay? So you go back to swiping again. And here's, here's the thing. Um, what do you say here? In-source swiping was becoming more challenging as retailers introduced EMV. Yeah, it was. In-source swiping absolutely got killer hard around that point in time. So you were having difficulty. And yeah, you were certain, and you were driving around the city. As I mentioned, you had to find stores. You had to map pl map stores out, uh, take trips, everything else, because you can't continue to swipe at the same store over and over because they're going to catch you if you do that. So that was your day. I mean, you were working your ass off. Criminals are not lazy folk. I'm not saying you're lazy. I am saying that you got cognitive dissonance and that, you know, you were a criminal the entire time. That was your primary focus. Toward the end of 2016, I got a job as a trader to managing my own firm portfolio. That's good. Okay, so here's what I, here we go. I'll fast forward a bit here. On March 3rd, 2017, you pled guilty to one count of aggravated identity theft. So here's the thing. There's a reason you're fast forwarding. And the reason that you're fast forwarding, I go back to what you were originally charged with, okay? You were charged with identity theft. So you were charged with aggravated identity theft. You were charged with money laundering. You were charged with access device fraud. I know that for a fact. And you were charged with conspiracy. That is a load of charges, okay? That's a load of charges, that's going to get you four or five years in prison. The aggravated identity theft is a two-year consecutive added on to whatever the hell else is going on. I know because I was charged with aggravated identity theft too. It's a two-year consecutive on top of whatever other sentence. So you were looking at four or five years. That's what you were looking at. But you said you pled guilty to one count of aggravated identity theft. And you were sentenced to two years felony probation and restitution. So we know, I know why you were given a lenient sentence. And you know that. And most people who are listening probably have guessed that. All right. It's not because you were a family man and you had two children and a wife. It's not because you were a good guy. It's because you told everything that you could possibly think of. And you told enough that you got out of serving time and you got supervised release. Okay. Maybe an ankle monitor or something like that as well. That is what happened, okay? The reason you chose, to, you said you were going to fast forward is because you did not want to say that. There is no shame in that, all right? At the end of the day, everybody talks. The people who don't talk wish they would have talked, all right? I served time with many a meth dealer who told me, man, I wish I'd opened my mouth as they're sitting there doing 20 years, especially with cybercrime. Cybercrime, they talk all the freaking time, all right? If they don't talk, somebody's going to talk on you, <laughs> and that's going to make you pissed off, and you're going to talk on them. So, I mean, that's what happened. You you talk, and you got a linear, linear sentence. Not hammering you for that, but let's be honest, okay? That's what happened. So, then you were able to get a job at the archdiocese. You got out of that trouble and everything. You were a felon. Yes, you're a felon. It's hard to get a job. I know. Been there, as you said. 
you got a job with the archdiocese business consultant. So that's a good, that's a good gig, man. And it lasted. So that was in 2018. So that lasted until 2023. So you, you've got, let's see. And then you took, you were chief of staff to one of the co-founders in 2021. So you've got an impressive resume there, except you said, you know, in May of 23, that changed the role ceased to be. So now you're worried about committing crime again because you've got three kids, three daughters, which I'm sure that you, the daughters love the hell out of their dad. All right. And I'm sure that your wife loves you too. Your wife loves you enough that she's not divorced your ass. So she obviously loves you. And she obviously believes that you're not breaking the law again, even though you and I both know you've already made that decision. And you're likely already doing it. Of course, I would imagine that you're having some difficulty. You're probably doing shit like refunding fraud and all that. And let me tell you, son, if you're doing that, you've already fucked up. All right. I know that for a fact. So, you know, it's it's um, a person that was thinking properly, a person that did not have the cognitive dis dissonance, the super optimism that you do the excuses that you've thrown out, things like that. A person that was thinking properly and objectively, that was able to step outside of themselves and look at the situation, would understand that you've got a very good resume. They would understand that you've got three children there whose lives you are now wrecking. Um, when you get caught and when you go back to prison, those three girls are going to be devastated. Absolutely devastated. All right, because they now know that their dad is not just, you know, didn't just make a mistake one time, but now he's a habitual fuck up. So they're going to be absolutely devastated. Your wife, if she's got any sense at all, files for divorce at that point in time. Of course, I'm not sure if she's working or anything else. So she may be between that rock and a hard place, which brings us to the budget that you were talking about, where you've got a 3K a deficit followed by several $2,000 monthly deficits. Are you the only one that's working in the house? Does your wife work? Can you pick up a second job? Yes, you can. You can. It may be, it may be hard. It may be a lot of work. But yes, you can. Or you can make the choice to take the easy way out of relying on crime to make those ends meet. The choice is yours, man, and, and what it boils down to is what's important to you. I've made the uh, I've made the statement time and time again that an addict cannot love anything except that which they are addicted to. You don't, uh, and I think that you're addicted to this. I absolutely do. That's uh, for your for that thought pattern to say I'm I'm already thinking about going back into crime. Well, that's that addiction for you. That's that. It doesn't have to be gambling or drugs or alcohol. It can be that activity itself. And let me tell you, you may tell yourself every single day that you love your wife and kids. You may tell yourself and convince yourself that you're doing it for your wife and kids. You're not. You're doing it for you. And you cannot love anything when you've got that that takes precedent over it. Okay? So you've got a choice to make. You can choose to do the right damn thing. Or you can continue doing what you're doing, and ultimately, you won't only wreck your life, but you'll wreck the life of, of your wife and your three kids and your victims and whoever else encounters you. Friends, if you've got any. Let me tell you, if you've got to lie to your friends, they're not your friends. Are you telling your friends that you're breaking the law? No, you're not. So you're lying to them too. Just because you don't say it, doesn't mean you're not lying. That omission is a lie in and of itself. All right. Um, sorry I'm climbing your ass, dude. Not really. Not really. You know, I got a uh, I got a friend. He posted the other day on Facebook that uh, he's 76. I served time with him. And uh, he posted the other day on Facebook that he was going to commit suicide. He was uh, in California. He was a pot grower in California. And uh, state charged him. He, uh, he was growing 902 plants. 
the California state charged him for that because he didn't have a permit to grow it for medical marijuana. They took him to court and they dropped the charges. The day they dropped the charges, federal authorities picked up the charges and they convicted him, gave him, I think they gave him like 10 or 15 years is what they gave him. He got out and as uh, I say, I got out in 2011. He was out a couple of years before me, but um, he's 76 now. So he was, you know, late sixties, mid to late sixties when he got out. Uh, no money, no ability to get a job, no family. Um, and he, he he was living in assisted housing, you know, uh, government housing, on food stamps, um, very restricted living. He I saw the other day he posted on Facebook that he decided to splurge for breakfast. And his splurging for breakfast was two sausage patties and two eggs. All right. Now, this is a man that did not deserve any prison time at all. He didn't. He didn't. He was growing pot, dude. Okay? The state didn't drop the charges. And then the feds picked it up because the feds had a hard-on back then for people growing marijuana. If he was picked up today, he wouldn't. He would get probation or something like that. He wouldn't get you know, 10 years, 10 or 15 years. I forgot what he, char- what he was actually sentenced to. But that wrecked his life. Okay, that that sentence wrecked his life to the point that uh, he posted he was committing suicide three days ago, three days ago. He had had a heart attack. Uh, He he no longer had any mobility. He uh, um, the heart attack had had caused a severe mental decline, 76. And he said that he was just going to take himself out instead of uh, ultimately being committed to a nursing home and then, you know, dying in a bed shitting and pissing himself and uh thing is is i understand that i don't like it but i understand that at the end of the day the only thing that he could control was himself but he had a choice you have the ability to get a job you've you've shown that business consultant you've got a nice You've got a a, a great re- a resume post-release. You've got the ability to get a job. You have family. I am sure that you are eating more than just, you know, the ability to have to splurge and have two fucking sausage patties and two eggs for breakfast. And yet you're telling me that you've got it hard. I have very little empathy for you. I have very little empathy. I have a lot of disgust because you've got family that care about you. You've got the ability to work. The only thing you have to do is realign your fucking budget. Yet, you don't want to do that. Anybody that's out there listening, you know, I said at the beginning of the show, man, if you if you want to, uh, if you're a criminal and you're serious about not breaking the law and wanting to turn your life around, I want to talk to you. I don't think that this guy is serious about that. I think this guy's already made the decision to break the law, that he's probably already doing it, that he doesn't, uh, you know, his actions scream volumes about not caring about his family or his children, his wife. Um there are all kinds of things that you could do that he could do to not break the law. You could get a second job. He could work two part-time jobs. His wife could get a job. Uh, if they're, if the kids are in some sort of uh, school where they have to pay for it, they go to a, a cheaper school. They could cut ends. They could, if they got multiple cars, they could turn one car back in. They could cash out 401ks. They could do all this bullshit. But instead he's, he's, he's sitting there thinking, Oh, I'm going to commit crime. I'm going to, go back into carding or refunding or whatever the hell. That's cognitive dissonance. That's that thought process. You know, that super optimism of you can get away with it. That, uh, that walled off thinking of, I got to do this. This is the only thing that I can do. You know, change your thought process and understand what I'm saying to you. Actions would change at the end of the day. I just think about my friend who didn't have anything, didn't have a job, who could barely afford to uh, to eat a proper breakfast. And you, on the other hand, have all this other stuff, have everything that he didn't. Think about that, man.
Think about that. I'm going to close out this show because I've got literally nothing else to say other than that. My name is Brett Johnson. How do we close out the show? We close it out the same way we close it out every single day, every time, by saying stay safe out there, stay secure, and stay vigilant. But more importantly, I, I need you guys to understand that this is the Brett Johnson show. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, just do the right damn thing. My name is Brett Johnson, and I want to thank you for listening. Until next time.